Most of our global financial infrastructure was built in the pre-internet world. Hello, I'm Jeremy Allaire, and welcome to The Money Movement. I'm very excited to be here in Singapore during Singapore FinTech Festival and uh, joined here by Sagal Mandelkar, who is at Rivet Capital, and I'm uh, very, very pleased to have you for this conversation. It's great to be here. Thank you. Yeah. Glad you flew me all the way to Singapore so we could chat. Exactly. It sort of works out that way. Yeah. Sort of. where, where are people? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So this is great. Um, I, uh, lots we can talk about, and of course, never enough time. But um, maybe just to start, you, you've had a distinguished career in both public service and also in the private sector, and now on the investing side at a preeminent uh, fintech-focused uh, venture capital firm. But you know, from your work at DOJ through the Treasury Department, um, maybe just talk for a moment about that arc and then sort of what brought you into... Um, both investing and sort of your deep interest in this whole blockchain technology space. Yeah, sure. So um, as you know, before I was at, at Rebit, uh, I spent a big chunk of my career in and out of the public sector, both at the Justice Department, Homeland Security, and then most recently as Undersecretary of Treasury for Terrorism and Financial Intelligence. Um, and in that job in, in particular, I had I oversaw OFAC and FinCEN and a policy shop and an intel agency, and it was very much a global job. Mm. Uh, and, um, and so I would travel all over the world. Uh, and this picture emerged for me in, in my travels when I was in emerging markets, the developing world, repeatedly when I would meet with central bank governors, finance ministers, heads of state, CEOs of banks, um, in, in certain parts of the world, they would say, can you help us get access to U.S. correspondent banking? Right. Um, and, uh, of course, I can't tell J.P. Morgan where to bank. Um, we could help those countries from a thinking about compliance, et cetera, perspective. But it was pretty striking um, to hear so many different regions of the world where they're saying, hey, we need, we really want access to the U.S., um, financial system, can can you help us? So I went back and I looked to see what, what was going on. Why were these countries asking for that? And it turns out that starting in 2012, we started to see this very steep decline all the way to today of U.S. correspondent banking. Yeah. Um, and there, I believe there are many reasons um, for that, um, which we could talk about at length. But But net net, it means that from when you think about things like financial inclusion, access to the dollar, U.S. economic tools, if Western banks or U.S. banks are getting out of those uh, out of those regions, mm -hmm. um, there's a lot to be worried and 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 concerned about. And so I came to the conclusion: our banks are not going in back in to mm -hmm. those regions. The only way that we were going to change this dynamic was through disruptive financial technologies. Mm. So I left uh, the Treasury Department in October 2019, and I gave myself some time to figure out what I wanted to do next. And along the way, I met uh, our founder, Vicky, um, who, who you know well. And um, although we had very different professional backgrounds, uh, we saw, saw the world in much, mm. in much the same way. And Within a week of talking to him, he said, hey, why don't you... Yeah, he was from Venezuela. I he think. was from Venezuela, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Um, and uh, he said, why don't you, you know, we've always wanted someone with your background. Why don't you think about come joining us? And I took a leap of faith, and here I am three and a half years later. That's amazing. Well, we, um, we care a lot about, you know, how do we bring dollars to the world? Uh, how do we improve financial access and, and, and inclusion and... You know, technology is a, a big part of this, obviously, and and software innovators and other things, right? They're going to be the ones who are are improving the financial system in many ways. Um, and uh, I know you you also um, you know you took a strong interest in um, you know what was happening with digital currency and with blockchains and um, you know as a core technology. And I know. 
you've been an advisor to Chainalysis. You guys are investors in Chainalysis and, and also a number of other uh, relevant investments as well. But sort of what is it about this technology that you, you, know, you think can help address those issues? And then maybe related, you know, what are some of the inherent risks that exist with that technology today, right? There's lots of stuff, news headlines, other things, always a, about like the risks with it as well. And that's something obviously that probably in your prior role, but also just regulators in general are focused on. So opportunity and risk and sort of what have you looked at as you've thought about this particular set of technology and in, in trying to improve that financial access? Yeah, it's a great question. So I think like many people who've been in this space, you have this sort of moment in time where you're like, oh, I, I see what's wrong with the current traditional system and why this technology can get us to a different place. And for me, um, that was part of that was the realization, uh, A, that most of our global financial infrastructure was built in the pre internet yeah. world. I mean, it's Absolutely. really striking, right? Yeah. So the, they did use FTP servers, though. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Cobalt, yeah. exactly. Uh, I like to say that, you know, I was introduced to the World Wide Web in 1993, and I thought it was just a fad because yeah. uh, we had DOS, but it turns out there are things that are much better. <laughs> and, then, um, and I'm not making my, that same mistake. So um, so that's number one, right? We, like, something has to change, because even though there've been, there's been modernization at, their, at the core, yeah. Um, it's very old programming language. And like you, I'm sure, I've had all kinds of frust frustrations when trying to engage in the, you know, um, in, the, in, the banking, in the banking world. Uh, and then you start to, um, you know, interact with the technology. You start to meet all kinds of uh, developers, computer scientists, cryptographers, wh whatever it is, and you really start to get excited about the, what, what the world can look like with global with global blockchains. You yeah. start to think about the fact that, going back to that problem I mentioned before, um, access to dollars. Well, with a stable coin, with USDC, yeah. uh, people who are living in countries of hyperinflation can instantly get access to something much more um, much, much steadier that's, that's more meaningful to yeah. them. They can put their money into what you know, some people call digital gold, Bitcoin. You know, it's really, yeah. it's really incredible that you, no matter where you are in the world, um, if you have some kind of internet access, you can participate in this economy. And so yeah. then you start to see, like, oh, the, what are the real possibilities here? Uh, and it, they're amazing and fascinating, and a lot to be excited about. So you got hooked, and you've been, you know, f you know trying to figure this out. Um, I like to refer to this as the internet financial system, right? We have the legacy financial system. We have this internet financial system. And it is literally built from the ground up on the internet. You know, the base layer of money is built, you know, as software-based, you know. Yes, there's an external database with the dollars at the Fed, in our case, um, so to speak. But, um, but this internet financial system, um, you know, is, is still emergent and... Um, we've, we've seen, you know, obviously growth in some of these emerging markets. We've seen growth as an investing technology, uh, cross-border technology. Um, but everyone's sort of looking at this and saying, okay, how does this become mainstream scale? Like billions of people accessing this and using it. And, um, and so we've had, you know, compliance and regulation two sides of the same coin in some cases have been like these vexing issues. Like banks haven't wanted to bank this sector because of the, uh, of the difficulty in, in meeting what they perceive to be, you know, their compliance requirements. And then you have an entire industry all around the world with kind of emerging compliance rules, VASP rules, other things, but sort of uh, ver variety, like, you know, sort of let's just say offshore actors that are not as interested in pursuing those. And so you have this very complicated market with, with this. When, when you imagine how we get to mainstream scale, what changes do you think are necessary? What are the, what are the avenues? And from an investor lens, I, I'm assuming you look at this as like, what are the problems to be solved um, to get from where we are today to billions of, of individuals and households and firms and others, you know, depending on this? Well, first and foremost, you know, like so many 
so many things. We actually need regulators to get much more comfortable with it because once you bring once you bring this technology into the regulated space, um, I and. Uh, and and re you don't have regulators who are saying you can stay. I don't understand it. I need you need to stay away from it. Then people are going to just naturally become, I think, more comfortable with it. Um, and and actually, when we were, I think I think we've sort of overcomplicated that problem. When we were at when I was at Treasury, I, I started in 2017. Vincent had already yeah, um, 2013. Set, 2013, yeah. they said if I you're, couldn't start my company without that yeah, ex regulation. Exactly. I mean, it was Jen Calvary at the time I who was. I remember. I testified next to her to the oh, Senate. Oh, you did. Yeah. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Jen said, "Look, you, it looks like you're involved in money transmittal. Yeah. It looks like you you all look like money yeah. money service businesses to me. So you yeah. have to build out financial crimes programs, et, yep. et cetera." And then I came in 2017, and I saw, look, there. Are really only three countries at the time in the world uh, that had the kind of regulation that we had. It was the U.S., it was Japan, and Australia. So we were ahead yeah, no. at the I time I tell people that like, the U.S. is like, I was like, actually, no. The U.S. was the very first country very in the world first. to regulate intermediaries exactly. in the space. And, and literally, I could not have, I, I have a funny story. I'll just quick tangent, yeah. which is that when, when I was putting together the company and I had Jim Breyer and Excel and others come, wanted to invest. I used my own money to hire Promontory Financial Group oh, to do diligence with the Treasury Department as to like, if I nice. build what I'm trying to build, like, can I do it? Is it yeah. legal? Like, yeah. or is this just gonna be like money down the drain? <laughs> and, um, oh. But I, I did that because I wanted to get a, a strong point of view yeah. from a regulatory perspective, that makes and sense. and you know got a got very clear indications like no you you could do this you just here's what it takes and yeah. so it's like okay this is going to be very expensive and a big investment but like we're we want to be kind of compliance first and yeah so but the U S had that framework we had that and yeah. that was visionary at the time and vis visionary yeah. of you to take that leap of faith um, and so and by the way so I 2017 I said. This, we have to change something. It's not having only three countries in the world with this kind of AML framework right. isn't sustainable. So we launched this massive push to get countries all over the world to have a similar set of rules yeah. because, you know, otherwise bad actors are just going to go to the to the jurisdictions that don't have that rules. Right. And and by the way, on the AML side, we were really successful. And then we thought about in and you have all these countries around the world that are really now taking it more mm -hmm. seriously. In 2019, we issued guidance, um, uh, which became very well known because we wanted to tell people what the rules of the road were. Because when they know what the rules of the road are, then they know what the boundaries are, yeah. how how they can how they can op operate. Something has changed, right? Since since then, there's just been a massive reluctance to mm. to do that um, from some regulators, um, which I think when that when that piece changes, when regulator, other regulators say, oh, okay, if I want to protect investors, maybe I should tell them what the rules of the road are. Maybe I should mandate things like disclosure, right. chief risk officers, yeah. compliance officers, right. segregation of customer assets. Right. Those are things we can solve for, and I totally. completely believe that we will. Um, and well, in many parts of the world we are, like, right? In many Here parts in of Singapore, world, for That's example. right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. In Singapore, they have... Yeah. Um, really, they've issued rules. Not everyone's loved them, not, but yeah. but they've been very experimental. They're interacting with the technology. Mm -hmm. They're encouraging, mm -hmm. um, you know, tokenization. Of, um, working with banks, by the way, yeah. and with crypto companies. It's it's so that it's it is coming, I think. And the thing that's really going to unleash it for the masses is when people um, appreciate that. When you use a stable coin to do payments or cross-border yeah. transactions, it's cheaper, it's more efficient. You can do it in a compliant way. By the way, you, I, I actually think at the end of the day, we're going to be better with crypto when it comes to AML than we are with Absolutely. traditional finance. I want to talk about that. Absolutely. Um, and I, I, maybe a bridge to that topic, which is um, you know, there's, there's sort of this tension that exists in the industry around, um, you know, hey, Blockchains are transparent and you have all the analytics and like they're actually terrible for criminals and so on and so forth, right? And and obviously, you know, there's another view which says, you know, 
this is the ideal thing in the world for, uh, for criminals and, and so on and so forth. And obviously it's probably somewhere in the middle, right? You know, there's sort of these, these there's a very strong, deep libertarian view on one side and, and then, you know, kind of, uh, you know, a, 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 I think a very conservative view on the other. And it's probably somewhere in the middle. But um, we, we, we do need to see the promulgation of things like the travel rule, and these kinds of expectations that exist in the traditional financial system, like if you're moving large sums of, of, of money, like that there should be a record and that you should kind of know, you know, your counterparties. And like it, it becomes difficult not to maintain, you know, financial integrity or, or rather it becomes difficult to maintain financial integrity without those kinds of things. And, um, you know, what do you think some of the steps are that are needed to kind of get there uh, on a global basis, not just in the U.S.? Yeah. So first and, and foremost, um, I, what I, one of the things I think that we need is a lot more openness by policymakers and regulators to experiment with a technology. You know, if you're in the U.S. today and you're a regulator, um, you can't have any crypto for right. the for the most part I mean it's pretty extreme right. even a stable coin I, I actually have this analogy I use now that it, like if you're at the Fed you can hold have a dollar even though you have influence over monetary policy right right so it go the dollar goes up and down what's the difference between that and having a stable coin and yet yeah. we have these extraordinarily arcane yeah. rules completely disconnected from what this technology is um, and, and what it's doing that's number one so you need you need, a, you need regulators to interact with the technology. Number two, I'm just someone who's always believed that if you put a set of developers, software engineers, computer scientists, and you tell them, hey, we have this new functionality, we need to figure out how to do things like on-chain compliance, identity, embedded yep. identity, et, et cetera, right. they are going to figure it out. I actually think at the end of the day, because you have this massive amount of talent thinking about how to solve for those problems, this sector is going to get, is going to be better yeah. <laughs> at AML than be, what you have right? in traditional finance. Because by the way, there are a lot of problems yeah. with how AML is done um, in, lot, in lots of different ways I could, yeah. won't bore you with, but could talk to you well, about Well, I mean, for I hours. think that the whole model of, of kind of uh, replicating all this PII all over the place and creating these honeypots of data and, 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 and actually using technologies that are not very good at security to even transmit and store all of that. That's so, right. you know, th th this is like, this is this is fragile, right? Yeah. Uh, it's like actually, you know, it creates well, a, the conditions that uh, allow for yeah. bigger exploits. Well, think about the fact that if I go to a liquor store and I show my, if I am lucky enough to get oh, I carded. Know, I know, this one. <laughs> <laughs> and I show my driver's license. Right. By the way, the not only the person who's, looking to make sure I'm 21 yeah. uh, because it's questionable, um, can see all of my information. Yeah. But there are security, right, <laughs> and there are security cameras. Yeah. And where are those security cameras coming from? Where's that technology being mm -hmm. rooted out, out to? So the, the possibility to, um, in our current system, yeah. to abuse yeah. identity, et cetera, they're just they're yeah. just endless. I used to prosecute a lot of those cases, right? You have hundreds and hundreds of millions of stolen uh, credit card numbers. And so yeah. we don't even have a social, we say social security, but there's no security in the social security um, any yeah. anymore. So again, it's put a, put a group of smart people and talk about how we can start to preserve yeah. privacy, use our, use our identity in fundamentally different ways. Um, there, there's so many different advantages, I think, again, in the long run to how we, how we can, how we can use this to cut down fraud, cut down, um, et cetera, if, if we, if we're just a little bit creative. Absolutely. You know, the, the word crypto has so many embedded meanings now, and it's sort of like, it's a bad word to certain people, but it's just cryptography. It's just cryptography. Cryptography yeah, is just exactly. math. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about like the best applied math that we have. So, okay, that's a pretty neutral thing. Like how do we use the best applied math to, to encrypt things, to protect information, to preserve privacy, but also to prove things? Yes. Cryptographic proofs allow us to use math to both shield information, but also prove things like an yes, identity or, exactly. or like uh, that you're meeting a certain attestation or requirement. So 
I think um, that's another place where I think, yeah, the, the, it, on both the kind of um, industry side and on the regulatory side, kind of have to kind of come together and say, look at this material that we have yeah. to work with to solve these problems. Right, and then there's the other piece, which is when you, again, when you think about cross-border tran transactions, there are all these different intermediaries mm -hmm. in our existing traditional system yeah. along the way that are collecting that data, that are making yeah. money off of you, boom, you know, you go from one to the other to the other. If you use USDC, if you use, you know, yeah. one of our companies, Sling, like, yeah. it just- it's a great product. It's a great product. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it just moves um, magically, yeah. compliantly. Yeah. Basically, it's about 50 some seconds, right? Yeah. So it's, uh, it's it's really we're getting there. We're so close. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think um, you know one, one of the things that we've spent a lot of time thinking about. We actually just started working on a new nonprofit standards foundation with Block, with the Linux Foundation, which is sort of you know essentially uh, identity credential models that will work alongside you know various types of of, of transactions. And I know a space that you've looked at has been um, you know kind of. Uh, you know, new blockchain infrastructure that that uses you know zero knowledge proofs and things like that to to simultaneously balance privacy and compliance and um, you know where do you think we are in that? Are you optimistic about that technology space? Oh, I'm so optim I'm so optimistic about it again because you yeah. know we've invested in companies that are that are um, that are working on it. We've you know we've I've worked with some of the best. Uh, experts really in the world in mm -hmm. that particular field. So mm -hmm. yeah, I'm very optimistic about it. I think it's really important, really needed. Yeah. I mean, 10 years from now, I think we're going to forget that we even had totally. driver's licenses because they don't really, yeah. why are we carrying yeah. this paper yeah. with These us? Cryptographic credentials are yeah. so yeah. superior. They're, they're yeah. so superior. And again, my belief is that we can do it in a way that's going to root out the bad stuff yeah. more successfully than what we have today. We just right. have to get to a place where regulators feel more comfortable mm -hmm. experimenting with it, building out standards. I mean, industry is yeah. building out standards, standards in lots key. of different ways. Yeah. Um, we also need to solve for things on the cybersecurity side. I mean, there's still, it's yeah. not a perfect right. system, but there too, we have great company, wallet security companies, Fireblocks, right. you know, who are really pushing the entire field forward. I know it's, it's a, yeah. you have phenomenal people. It's a big, it's a big thing for you. So, um, but we are without a doubt, we're gonna, we're gonna get there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm an optimist. I'm, <laughs> I, I, I lead through optimism and, and things like that, but I, um, I, I do, I do agree with you. And, and um, I, I think a lot of people just don't see this. They don't, they, it's gonna surprise them um, as these things kind of come online. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I think um, you know it's a it's a complex world <laughs> that we're in, and yeah. and there's a lot of attention on these issues right now, and um, and we have this kind of excel. The internet continues to accelerate. I mean, AI acceleration, you know, blockchain acceleration, other things, and um, but but these these issues are are really really core. We have to solve them. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, well, Segal. Great to have you on the show here. and have Thank this conversation. You. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's always great to be with the Circle team. So, Thank you.